Hello and welcome to this episode of Demystified as we explore home cooking in a modern world. Hello. I'm Linda. And Are I'm you? I'm, who am I? And hello, I'm Linda and I'm here with my friend Paul. Are you sure? I don't know. Today, wow, is this the first time we've caught up in ages? Well, I was away for a bit. I know, Didn't and we've had things on. Yeah. So, so this has been uh, a long time coming. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. Very Fri- good. Friday. For a Friday? Yeah. I know. And that's, I have just become a space cadet. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah. So I have been thinking about questions to ask you. I know, and, and you want to talk about something that I don't want to talk about. I want to talk about something else, but we'll go with what you want to talk about first. For once. Woohoo! Okay. My, the- mine's brief. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. Well, I've actually got two things, so we'll squeeze yours okay. in in the middle. So the first thing I wanted to talk about were almond trays and the importance of the shelf height in so in the oven shelving, not trays. Yeah. In the shelving. So does it matter? What are some basic rules? Or you know, do you cook your pav up high? Do you cook your pav down low? Does it matter? Because I've got some settings on my oven that I'm sure I've never used, which is you know, the top and bottom heat. It's just yep. it's all on, fan forced or in the bottom oven. Yeah. That doesn't have steam. But uh, I'm just wondering, what are the the importance of tray height, shelving height in uh, cooking? Okay. So probably the the thing to consider is what function you choose. So if we just park steam for a second. So depending on your oven, and this can be applicable for all ovens, there are different heating elements that are used depending on the function. So in the case of your bottom oven, you will have what is known as a bake element or a bottom heat element only, potentially. Yes. You will have a top heat element as well, which we refer to here as the grill. Americans refer to it as the broiler. Okay, so you have a top heat element and then you have the fan force. Now fan forced, Yes, it's a fan, but there is a heating element around the fan. So, rule of thumb, there isn't one. <laughs> but the idea behind, if you take the what the idea behind fan forced is, fan forced is designed, there's a heating, a heating element that surrounds the fan. So it goes on the outside of the fan. So the fan is in the middle, and around that fan there is a heating element. And as that heating element turns on, that, Radiant heat is then blown into the oven. And that's how fan force works. The, the idea behind fan force is to circulate that heat evenly throughout the cavity. So that is more designed for multiple shelf cooking. Oh. Okay. Okay, you didn't know that. So it's designed for when you have two, let's say you've got two trays or two dishes or two oven trays or whatever in your oven you've got your roast at the top and your vegetables down the bottom and they're in two separate Mm -hmm. trays so fan forced is actually designed (coughs) for multiple shelf cooking now we'll get on to the reasons why i think it's better for all cooking but there are other heat elements so your top heat element is the generally depending on your oven and there are a couple now which actually have the top heat element covered but the top heat element or the grill or the broiler element is the only generally exposed heat element within your oven. So it's not behind a shroud, it's not behind any piece of metal, it's actually, you can see the heating element itself. And when it turns on, it glows red and you can see it and da 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 And generally most people when they're grilling or broiling will work towards the top. So from the middle towards the top. Because effectively what you're trying to do is get color on the surface of something not looking for a long, slow, internal cook. No, you're grilling cheese. You're grilling cheese, yeah. Something. Finishing off a gratin, you're trying to get a crispy skin on your pork. Pork Something like that, right? The bottom heat element, um, most people would work towards the bottom half of the oven, okay? So if you have six levels in your oven, 
for six positions where you can put oven trays, and they're numbered from one to six, bottom to top. Bottom heat element from three to one, top heat element from three to six. That's sort of how I work it, because if you were trying to blind bake a pastry case, the problem with blind baking is, is generally, if you blind bake without a bottom heat element, the outside edge of your pastry case colors, but the base sweats because you put pastry weights in it, sometimes mm -hmm. foil or baking paper or something, and it sweats and it doesn't cook. So bottom heat element is designed to get some heat directly underneath what you're cooking, and it'll crisp up the base of a pastry in the case of blind baking. Other things that it's good for is when you want heat coming from the bottom. So a really good example, and you can probably see it in your mind's eye, is getting a souffle to rise. Heat coming from the bottom will actually help push the souffle up rather okay. than heat coming from the top. Okay. Heat coming from the top won't help your souffle rise. Heat coming from the bottom will help your souffle rise. Now, in the case of a souffle, you actually don't want a fan going because it'll actually blow because they're light and airy. It'll blow the souffle around and you might break it. Okay, so that stagnant heat is quite good. Okay, that explains now, why my souffles have an edge in the <laughs> Yeah, because you bust out souffles all the time. Um, now, that said, I will, and if you, for those people that do steam cooking and standalone steam cooking, so, you know, the steaming anywhere up to 100 degrees, so no heat elements as such, just using steam, you'll note that your ovens have the fan going while that steam is going into the oven. All right, that fan circulates the heat, okay? So it circulates the steam throughout the cavity. And generally on combination modes, so various manufacturers have different modes of what they call combination modes, but essentially dry heat and steam together, nine times out of 10, and it's not all, it is actually probably about eight and a half to nine times out of 10, that will use the fan forced element and steam together. So whenever there is steam in the cavity, there is an fan going generally um, because that circulates the steam throughout the cavity now for everyday day-to-day -day cooking on conventional oven modes I will always lean towards fan forced unless I'm doing something specific like souffle or I want to get a color on a gratin by grilling it or broiling it now why why do I do it because I think you get better heat distribution throughout the cavity no one puts a piece of something into an oven tray and measures the distance from the door to the back and the left and the right and tries to find the exact perfect center point of the oven when they cook, right? So you throw your roasting dish in with your roast beef in there and you set it on fan forced. The reason that that's better is the heating element at the back, while it is circular, it still has two points where it actually joins the electronics, which is actually the hottest spot. Because those two parts of the heating element are closest together, and that's generally where you will get hot spots in a back corner of an oven. So by having fan forced going, the fan actually tempers that heat a little bit and gives you a more all over even cook. So if you don't put your roast in, in the perfect spot, you'll get a generally more even cook by having movement. I think movement and air movement is almost just as important as how well the heat is regulated. So it also gives you the freedom of not having to adjust shelves. So if you want to cook a little lower down in your oven, if you've got something taller, a big roast chicken or a roast turkey, something that's quite tall, you want to put the roasting dish down the bottom of the oven so it's got room in the cavity to fit it. So I would say fan forced is better in that scenario as well, even though the dish is itself down lower. Mm. Air okay. movement. Mm. So it's movement. If you take something like the idea behind, like let's say traditional sous vide cooking in a water bath, you have an immersion circulator, which is a heating element, essentially. It holds and maintains temperature really evenly. You know that, but the second most important thing about an immersion circulator is the movement of it. Without the movement, you, you would have different temperatures throughout the depth of the water. 
So the closer that you your sous vide pouch of food got to the heating element, the hotter it would be if it didn't have movement. The further away and the further towards the top from that heating element, it would be cooler. It might only be a few degrees, but it would be cooler. So movement in cooking or in closed cavity cooking is just as important. So I will nine times out of 10, unless I'm doing something very specific, shoot for fed course or an oven function with the fan going. So some of them you can combine. So there'll be ovens out there that'll have an icon for bottom heat. And generally it's a straight line, okay, on your display or on your dial or something like that. It's just got a straight line. And then you might have a picture of a fan. Now, if that fan's got a circle around it, that means that the fan is going, the, the fan element is going and the bottom heat element is going. If it doesn't have a circle around the fan, it just means the fan is operating. And what's happening is just the heat's coming from the bottom and the fan is circulating that heat from the bottom. Okay. So there are a lot of different ways you can go about it, but unless you're doing specific jobs where you want what I term as stagnant heat, the bottom heat work towards the bottom half of the oven, the top heat work towards the top half of the oven. For everything else, have a fan going. See, I thought this would be a really quick question, and I thought you were going to say, Pam's in the bottom, scones in the middle, Biggie's on top, and how wrong was I? Well, it's not that simple. No. Pat, like, no. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for that. But you've also proven a lot of things to me that people don't read their user manuals, so... <coughs> yeah. um, anyway. Anyway, <laughs> moving on. Your turn for a question, or for a statement. Is it I, a comment? Is it a statement, comment, or question? No, it's probably, and it's probably more focused on where we are now in the depths of winter, cold, rubbish. Not very pleasant to be out and about. I was, um, I had to go and do a function last week or this week, I can't remember what it was, and I had to think of a vegetarian dish, and what I wanted to talk to people about was ugly vegetables. Okay, that's that's not how they're marketed in the supermarket, Paul. No, but some of these you won't find in the supermarket, which is the other thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, just because you don't know what it is... Ah, are you going to mention a kohlrabi? Kohlrabi. Another one which is quite unappealing to the eye, but which has quite a lot of uh, potential for really nice preparation and good eating is something like celery app. Okay, which is... Mm -hmm. looks like a big ugly bulb other ones which I've noticed around and I just took a bit of a wander around the market Jerusalem artichoke oh yes okay. really mm. hideously ugly vegetable but sometimes sometimes the uglier the better because it will give you results which you probably have never experienced before and just to give a little bit of insight grab a celery act put it on a bed of rock salt and put it in your oven at 140 degrees, skin on, you don't have to do any prep, nothing, and 140 degrees and roast it for three hours. Pull it out, cut away the exterior with a knife, and then just pan fry chunks or wedges of that slow cooked celery act. You might start changing what you add to your vegetable mix when you're doing your roast veggies at night. Well, I must say, I did, um See you prepping for that function mm. last week. Well, we did. I did kohlrabi. <laughs> and you did kohlrabi. And I must say, I had. Um, I saw the pan that you cooked it in, and you cooked it that way. And all I saw in the salt were these little puddles of brown in amongst this sort of sea of white. And you know, the the result was that lovely dish that you made for an entree. Mm. And I had a little taste, and it was fantastic. And I mu I was really impressed. I thought I I can do that. And it's very, like, it's literally grab the vegetable, stick it in the oven, roast it. And the only trick there is put it on a bed of rock salt to just take that moisture away. Because you want to try and remove some you of You do go through moisture. a lot of salt because the whole pan dish has got to be, have, be covered a little thin, a little I was layer. doing, like, 10 kohlrabi. Oh, were they? Yeah. There was, okay. like, a lot of kohlrabi in there. Okay. If you're doing it at home, you only just need uh, oh, just enough, salt, uh, enough salt to just cover the base of it. Okay. Okay, it doesn't need to be... Don't listen to me, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, ugly vegetables. Give them a go. Don't be scared of them. And then, oh, look, we could get into, like, 
the whole raft of sort of vegetables and the Asian grocers, which we don't come across that often and maybe don't use and there's some rules of the cucumber type yeah. things and stuff like that. We can get into that at some other stage, but those winter sort of root vegetables and tubers and stuff like that, like Jerusalem artichoke makes it the most flavorful soup, the best soup. And to level it up, just put a seared scallop on top of it. Like just, that that's a like outstanding entree. Like really, really good. So those things that, People think, uh, you know, they walk past them. Like kohlrabi just doesn't sell. Right? Just doesn't. I know it doesn't sell. And it's actually hard to find sometimes because people don't use it. They don't know what to do with it. So that's another one. Just grab it, stick it in the oven. And you can do the same process with anything, like a sweet potato, pumpkin, anything. Put it on a bed of salt, slow cook it at 140 degrees, and then just pan fry once you remove the skin, just pan fry pieces in just a little bit of olive oil and butter. Absolutely delicious. And it's any vegetable. Okay. Well, that leads me into my second question because I was driving to work the other morning and it was dark and uh, cold. And at the time we're recording this, half of Australia is in lockdown. We've not us. A, not us. Woohoo, we're in Victoria. Sucked in everyone and else. <laughs> for once, it's not us. But uh, we did like to thank those people in South Australia and New South Wales for sharing their virus with us. <laughs> but uh, we managed to escape uh, a lockdown for just now. this once, for now. But some uh, restaurants up in, in New South Wales are doing it tough because they had bookings, they had orders and they had all this food. And I was listening to one of the enterprising chefs there talk about how he makes pumpkin soup. And they were giving it away to people because they had all this food. And I thought, what a great gesture, hang on, what a, a wonderful thing to do for your community when you're all doing it a bit tough. But he talked about how he takes his pumpkins and he slow roasts them whole, and then he takes them out, scoops out all the flesh, blitzes it with a kind of broth he makes of some, you know, chicken stock and garlic and bits, yep. and um, and bobs your uncle. Yep. He puts in a little bit of, I think he said garlic and... Yep. I can't remember what else he said, but I thought, wow, that sounds... I've never made pumpkin soup that way. Yeah, it's not have a... Have you ever done that? Yeah. Okay, Yeah. of course you have. So, it, but literally, it's that's exactly what I'm talking about, doing exactly that. So that, those vegetables that you roast like that, you can either do what I suggested, which is pan fry portions of them, just because to get the colour on them. Um, but the other alternative is, of course, turning them into soup. The problem when you make... Tradi like let's say a traditional version of a pumpkin soup is you take your pumpkin, you peel it, you sweat off, um, you know, garlic, onion, ginger, whatever, right? And then you add pumpkin pieces and then you add moisture, generally, like a stock, right? So you're adding liquid to a, a vegetable that is already very high in moisture content. Pumpkins are loaded with cucumbers, 70% moisture most of the time. That's why you can't get pumpkin crisp really hard what he's doing is actually cooking out a lot of the moisture through the slow roasting process and intensifying the flavor so he's getting maximum flavor for minimum effort because he's not adding any more liquid than what he actually needs to because he's removed a lot of it from the pumpkin if you actually want to do it like even an easier pumpkin soup and this is like stupid easy do exactly that go grab yourself a pumpkin roast it Pumpkins are big, so it might take a little bit longer. Roast it in the skin, leave it in your oven. About 140 degrees is about right. Any hotter you're starting to get a bit too hot. 140 degrees until you can put a knife in it and it just is, just goes in and out, or a toothpick just goes in and out. Then you know it's cooked. Leave it cool. Remove the skin. Stick all of that flesh in a blender. Add some coconut cream, salt and pepper. Done. Blend it. It's pumpkin soup every day of the week. Like, that's the sheet's laziest version of pumpkin soup you'll ever hear. Sounds good to me. <laughs> but, it, like, it's literally two ingredients, well, three ingredients. Pumpkin, coconut, salt. That's it. And it, it will be super, super pumpkin flavoured because you just, it's just pumpkin. There's still moisture left in the pumpkin because there is so much moisture left in the pumpkin, but it's enough for it to actually blend into a soup or a puree okay. or something like that. Like, that's a really good good method of making a puree too. 
that's that slow roasting. You're just intensifying the flavour of it, removing the excess moisture, which you don't need. Any pumpkin? Yeah. Butternut? Or Jab, can, any, any, anything. Any pumpkin? Yeah, butternuts will take a while because they're kind of dense. So I know butternuts are a favourite for people that make soup. Um, okay. I actually think Jap pumpkins are better flavour. A little bit difficult to deal with just because of the shape of them. Butternuts are easy to deal with. Um, but yeah, blue, I think there's Queensland blue is another type. But yeah, any pumpkin. You could do it, you're like, you could do that with celery. Okay. And just get it to a point that it's like really, really soft. Mm. Blend some, chuck the cooked celery out in the blender. For that, because it's a little bit denser, you might need to add a little bit of stock, a little bit of stock, a little bit of cream, a little bit of butter as it blends. Like you don't have to sweat onion, garlic, and all the rest of it. Like when you eat a pumpkin soup, do you really taste the onions and garlic? No. Yeah. So what are we talking about here? Like, no. Why not just if you're going to make a pumpkin soup, you want it to taste like pumpkin soup. Pumpkin. Pumpkin. So just put pumpkin yeah. in it. Okay. And coconut's quite a good, you know, little mix. Coconut cream. Yeah. Just a tin of coconut cream. Do it while it's hot. Like, blend it while the pumpkin's still hot. But it'll be, like, super silky smooth as long as you've roasted it enough. Easy as. Okay. Like, easy as. Well, there you are. Yeah. So my second question that, uh, well, there you are, was kind of related to your... Well, there you are. How's yeah. that? You can do it with cauliflower. You can do it with anything. Okay. Yeah. Get cauliflower that's covered in its leaves. Oh, yeah. Still. And then just stick that whole thing. In the oven, the whole cauliflower, and then you can make cauliflower steaks. You can make, you know, do a whole roast in cauliflower. But the trick is, is getting that moisture out of it, but not. You're never going to get it all the way out, but out of it, so it's super soft, and then finish it either in a soup or get some colour on it some other way. But essentially, think of it like doing a sous vide steak. Get the cooking process done first and then put some colour on it. Okay. Ah. It's no different. Well, there Just you are. Just with vegetables. Well, thanks for that. Yeah. I might put that into our... You're going to make a pumpkin soup this weekend, I can tell. Oh, maybe not this weekend. Because it's seriously the laziest thing. <laughs> no, it is. I am thinking, but it is, does sound pretty lazy. And You just, seriously, you can just put the pumpkin on. You can set really the timer helpful. on your oven and see you later. I must say, I was so taken with the kohlrabi. I, I did want to try that, but I also like celery act, so I yeah. might try that as well. Yeah. You, know, I mean, you can do it with yeah. beetroots. You can do it with, like... Oh, I love beetroot. Yeah. Mm. Anything. Anything. They're hard to get in Victoria in winter, aren't they? No? Someone hasn't been to the market that we are actually in Oh, I haven't. Recently. I actually <laughs> I haven't been out of my office for about three weeks. There's really fast nice beetroot over there today, oh, actually. Really? But anyway. Right there. Yeah. Um, right there. I'll go there on the weekend. Well, thank you for that, Paul. And it's good to see you. It's been yes. a while. And oh, and there's uh, new videos up. Oh, I don't know if Joel's put them up. Joel, where's Joel? It's like, where's Wally? Um, there's. Only it's harder to find Joel <laughs> because he only wears black. Um, but there is some videos and stuff which will go up. I think. Uh, so we did a tutorial on flounder, how to skin it. So that's applicable for. Our friends in the US as well, it's like sole or lemon sole. Mm, um, nice. So how to skin it? We did a sous vide with peanut butter. What else did I do? Japanese milk bread, which is okay. like the like that really cheap, soft white bread loaf that you get in the supermarket. So it's really good for like toasted sandwiches and like a sausage and bread and that sort of oh. stuff. Does that involve steam only or does it involve combi? No, nah, com I mean steam only to prove it and combi okay. to do And what was the other one I did? Uh, there's another one I did. I can't remember. Oh, apple strudel after you oh, talked yes. about it. Apple, so I did yes. a traditional apple strudel with made pastry. Uh, yes. I didn't buy it, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, I it do it takes all the ten, It takes all of ten, ten, 10 minutes to make the pastry. So yeah. it's a, you... you. No, 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 it's seriously, you don't have to rest it, it's easy. Like, oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. I'll look at the rest. Well, I'll look at the video when it's up and have a look. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Go and right. good to see you. And uh, yeah, we'll be back. We'll be back. Stuff. Buy the book. Soon. It's on Amazon. Buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the book is up. Yeah. And available Amazon? worldwide. Amazon. 
Is it on Booktopia? It's on Amazon around the world, but not in Australia. Yeah. Because we still have copies yeah. here, and it's Booktopia. cheaper to buy it from us than to buy it through Amazon in Australia, in Australia. only yeah. because of the postage. Yeah. Whereas the rest of the world, you just pay local postage. But it's up. Hooray. Yay. So thanks, everybody, and uh, happy cooking. Happy cooking. Take care. Bye, Paul. Pumpkin soup. Bye, everybody. Pumpkin soup. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this podcast as we explore home cooking in the modern world. We'd love you to subscribe and for more information, please go to our website, cookingwithsteam.com.